All right. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mariana Pinchuk. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am currently a product manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, working in the product and technology department, and I work on an initiative called Future Audiences, uh, which I will get into in a minute. Um, so I was invited here to kind of continue the conversation that we started last year at Wikicon North America in 2023 in Toronto. Uh, and that was the first Wikicon North America that met in person post-pandemic. Um, so it was a really interesting moment where uh, I think, you know, a lot of things had changed in the world um, since 2019. Uh, and also some of us, myself included, uh, went from feeling like we were the young, hip and with it people to maybe feeling like we weren't so much the young and hip and with it people anymore, uh, to seeing a new generation uh, emerging in the world, um, behaving differently, doing things differently. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting time. Um, and so a lot of us uh, were talking at Wikicon North America last year about, you know, this, this is a, now a movement of over 20 years. Uh, we've been doing this project of collecting free knowledge. Um, but there are new generations emerging, um, and how do we reach out um, and engage those new audiences in becoming a part of our movement? Um, and even knowing that we exist in this very busy and crowded internet environment um, and in caring about um, joining us to, to gather and share free knowledge. Um, so I want to start my talk with probably the first in a series of crossroads metaphors that you're going to hear probably in many talks uh, at this conference, um, which is that, yes, I think um, we are at a crossroads today with technology, um, with how the world is changing all around us. Um, but I would like to posit that, A, this is not new for our movement. We have been at crossroads moments before, and I want to zoom back to one uh, that I knew about and, and remember going through myself. Uh, and we have faced the challenges of new emerging technologies. Uh, we have made intentional changes to our projects uh, to take them in a new direction. So I am very optimistic that we can do it again. Uh, so I'm going to start, like I said, even though I'm here to talk about the future, we have to look at our past. Uh, so that's my past right there. That's an embarrassing picture of me from 15 years ago. Uh, <laughs> that is me, young, fresh-faced Mariana, who had just joined the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and here I am helping a newcomer learn how to edit. Uh, I am uh, at a Women's History Editathon, I believe, here in the San Francisco office of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, so that's back when we had an office wild. Uh, and the entirety of the Wikimedia Foundation, all 60 of us, um, could fit into one floor of it, one, one office space. Uh, so I joined uh, because I was hired as a researcher to understand uh, different community dynamics, the history of how uh, different Wikipedia projects had gotten to where they were in 2010. So that was about a decade of, of time since Wikipedia had existed. Uh, and I got obsessed. I read every single ARBCOM case uh, in both English and Russian Wikipedia in detail, all of the notes. Uh, I started editing myself as a volunteer. I started meeting community members from all around the world. And I just fell in love with this movement and these people. I really felt like I had sort of found my tribe. Uh, so what else was going on at that time, 2010? Uh, like I said, about 10 years since uh, Wikipedia had started. Uh, there were some eerie similarities between then and now. Uh, so this is a picture from Wikimania 2010. Does anyone remember where that was? 2010 Wikimania? Gdansk, yes, Poland. It was in Poland. And Wikimania this year was also in Poland. Uh, we've come full circle. Uh, so, yeah, this is a picture of a strategy breakout session where, uh, well, these people are not, but the ones around them are talking very actively and busily about um, participation on the projects. Um, that was a really big topic back then. Uh, but there's one thing in this picture that, to me, really jumps out as uh, dating it to a very specific time, uh, this particular time. Does anyone also have that same immediate, oh, this is... Cameras. 
Oh, how young we were, yes. Yes, but yes, cameras, uh, phones, right? No, no one in this picture has a smartphone. It's 2010, smartphones are available, but uh, no one has a phone, they're living their lives. No, uh, <laughs> uh, they have digital cameras here that they're using to take pictures, which um, for those of you who you know, uh, don't remember that era of MySpace, um, that's what we were using. We were using these digital cameras that produced not great pictures most of the time. Uh, so obviously some stuff has changed since then. So why uh, did the Wikimedia Foundation hire me? Why did they need a researcher to understand community di dynamics and community growth? Uh, and why, what were all of these people so frantically talking about, not on their phones, but you know, in real life? Uh, this was a graph that I think uh, Sue Garner also showed last year at her keynote at Wikiconference North America. This was uh, a graph that was created around 2009, 2010. Uh, it shows the all active editors on all Wikipedias um, over time. So since the start of Wikipedia in 2001, uh, up until I think this one goes to, to 2013. Uh, and you can see it's a huge precipitous rise in participation around 2003 to 2006. Uh, and then in 2006, something happens and the growth stops and the line kind of goes down. Depending on how you look at it, you could see that as a stabilization or a decline. Um, but this was, you know, really concerning to everyone in the movement. Everyone who saw this graph had a, a very visceral reaction to it. We used to call it the oh shit graph because it was so scary uh, to see this information. Uh, so there was a movement strategy process on strategy wiki uh, and I promise strategy wiki was a very important and serious space where people had very important and serious conversations. However, I have intentionally chosen the silliest artifact from that time to bring here, uh, which is, is not actually as silly as it looks. Um, so this is a, a series of, of images that one of the contributors to strategy wiki made uh, around this time to illustrate the point that, that he was trying to make. Um, which is that he predicted that Wikipedia was doomed. That was it. We had had a good run. We had had 10 years of solid growth and success, and now it was just going to decline into nothing. So that's that fact line that you see there. Uh, then there's this Jimmy line, which I will, I will get to in a minute. There's some interesting stuff there. Um, let's just leave that for the time being. Um, but then there's a, this community line, right, that's going up and to the right, like we all want all lines on all graphs to go, that's where the good space. Uh, and I think that is communicating that in 2010, the, the, the global Wikipedia movement, Wikimedians all around the world, many of them did not want growth of, of participation on the projects to stop. They didn't want it to just kind of continue flat. They definitely didn't want it to decline and turn into nothing. Uh, they wanted a lot more people to come and join them, to help them do the work on the projects, the work that was continuing to grow and pile up with every new article that was added, with every new language that was added, um, and particularly in languages that hadn't amassed a big community and hadn't amassed a lot of content yet. There was this fear that, like, oh no, we'll never catch up to English Wikipedia without more, more people. So this is a really great distillation of that whole era, the sentiment around it. Um, so I wanna talk about actuals now because with the benefit of time, we know what actually happened, right? Um, and it was this, so Jimmy was right, uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, what you can see here, and this, this is just the active editors graph, but you know, kind of dragged over to, to now, to 20, 2024. Um, we have not, thankfully, experienced the precipitous decline that this, um, this strategy wiki participant predicted, uh, but neither have we seen this kind of tremendous growth uh, in, contribu in contributors that we hoped for in, in 2010. Um, we've kind of maintained stability, uh, so that doesn't mean that exactly the same people are here as were in 2010, it just means some new people have joined and others have left and it's kind of remained in an equilibrium more or less, right? But I think equilibrium sort of indicates that, you know, it just 
it was all is static, nothing changed around us, uh, nothing changed in the communities. And uh, those of you who have been around the last 15 years know that that's certainly not true. Uh, the projects that we have today, the technology we have today does not look like uh, what it did in 2010. Um, I want to talk now about how we maintain this sort of stability um, actively, some of the things that we did differently to, to get to where we are today. Um, and a lot of that involved paying attention to the world around us and seeing the exciting breakthrough technologies in the 2010s. Uh, do you remember what I'm talking about when I say breakthrough 2010s technology? I see some phones, I see some phones, yes. But what about Google Docs? Google Docs, no? No one's like, yeah, wow, that was a revolution. Uh, it is, it, it was a revolution. Uh, before Google Docs and other sort of what you see is what you get, WYSIWYG type editors. Um, so in the early period of the internet, in the early 2000s, when Wikipedia was first starting, uh, in order to write text and format text online, you had to know some kind of markup language. Um, you had to know HTML or something similar to be able to do this in the first place uh, and to collaborate with anyone on a document. Um, so, you know, when I was a teenager, I had to learn HTML so I could format the background and fonts on my live journal. Uh, <laughs> The people who were coming online after Google Docs and other WYSIWYG editors were widely available did not have that expectation. <laughs> they did not expect to have to learn a markup language in order to just make something bold or italic or add a reference. Uh, so this technology really created a very different set of beliefs and understandings of how the internet should work in a whole new generation of people. Uh, smartphones, yes, um, you all raised your phones to me, indicating that, yes, you remember that as a big technological change that happened um, in the early 2010s. Um, before these things were available, no one would have thought that you could read an encyclopedia, let alone edit an encyclopedia on this tiny little handheld device, um, but now they're here all around us today. Uh, and the experience of looking at Wikipedia on a phone in 2010 was uh, very hard to read and um, navigate and there was no interactivity. It's very, very confusing. Um, but a lot of other companies, websites were very busy making lots of really slick mobile websites and apps uh, to reset the expectations of, of what that kind of experience should be like. So again, people kind of coming online after the smartphone revolution just expected everything that they could do on a desktop to also be possible on a phone and then on an iPad and, you know, maybe in the future AR, who knows. Okay, one last big technological trend that I know we were all paying attention to in the early 2010s, but you may have forgotten about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right, Bitcoin. Bitcoin was huge in 2010s era internet uh, in the world. Uh, there was a moment in time where I think every single company, nonprofit, uh, was hiring a chief blockchain officer to do something uh, unclear. Uh, there were a lot of Bitcoin enthusiasts uh, in the Wikimedia movement who were personally interested in this technology, who were advocating for it being integrated somehow into Wikipedia. Um, I bring up this because it is an example of an of a important trend that was very alive in 2010, but that we didn't really act on <laughs> in the way that we did with uh, WYSIWYG editing, with mobile. Uh, those were things that, you know, we all, we all saw as being important to consider, to sort of absorb into the context of what we do with our free knowledge projects. With Bitcoin, uh, for better or worse, you currently, as an editor, don't get paid a token for every edit that you make. Wikipedia is not on the blockchain. Um, just because a trend exists and just because a lot of people are talking about it does not mean that it's going to end up influencing what we do. So, Okay, so back to this um, prediction. I love this graph. I'm just going to keep showing this graph over and over again. I want to talk about the Jimmy line now, because what I've been talking about is responding to external trends, responding to things that are happening in the world around us, which we did. We invested in the visual editor, 
in mobile, in a lot of other experiences to kind of bring our projects up to parity with what was going on in the internet um, in the 2010 to 2015 era. And I think that's what helped us to maintain this equilibrium that we see. Uh, but there was another really important thing that I wanted to get to, which is that 2006 stop in growth. Um, I showed an unflattering picture of myself, and now I'm showing an unflattering picture of Jimmy. Sorry, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> so in 2006, uh, Jimmy went to Wikimania and gave a keynote in which he urged the communities to stop focusing on just amassing all the content, uh, stop, stop necessarily growing in content and, and, and contributors, and really focus on the quality of the content. Um, and I think that was, you know, a reaction to the fact that Wikipedia was becoming more popular, more mainstream, uh, more of a reliable resource and a, and a vital one. So vandalism had a, you know, hit different, as the kids say today, uh, than it did in 2001 or 2003. Uh, so Jimmy was not, I don't think he was tyrannically urging the community to do something that it didn't want to do. I think he was kind of channeling the ethos at the time, which was, you know, maybe we shouldn't just let anyone edit all the time and mess up these articles that we've spent so much time working on. Uh, maybe we should focus on ensuring that the quality of the content is really, really good. Um, and in this time period, you saw a lot of uh, bots and tools being created that were uh, used to counter vandalism to kind of maintain the quality of articles. So Cluebot came around around this time, uh, now Cluebot NG. Um, Huggle and Twinkle, two very popular sort of assisted vandalism patrol softwares, came around during this time. And these were things that allowed uh, kind of a stable, fixed community that wasn't growing very fast to continue to do the, the work of keeping the encyclopedia strong and good, uh, even as the volume of work, the volume of new edits, the volume of new content to look at and monitor continued to rise. So, I bring this up as an example of a time where our very fractured, decentralized, thousand opinions in one room volunteer communities sort of made an intentional choice. They, they made a choice to focus on quant quality uh, and reliability of the content, um, probably at the expense of some you know, new contributors. Uh, and, and that choice is what brought us here today. So, did a lot of talking about the past. I'm gonna segue into the future now with this beautiful MS Paint art that I made myself. Thank you very much. Uh, I showed this at Wikimania uh, to try to illustrate what future audiences is for the Wikimedia Foundation um, and how we're thinking about all of these technological challenges that we're facing now. So, you know, we, we've surpassed, we've surmounted and surpassed the WYSIWYG revolution, the mobile revolution, Bitcoin revolution that happened uh, also. <laughs> um, and here we are today with new challenges on the horizon. How are we thinking about w where are we going to find this next generation of editors to come and help us with our projects, given all this change? Um, so Future Audiences is an initiative of the Wikimedia Foundation. It is a little wedge here in the big pie of the investment that we make at the Wikimedia Foundation in product and technology. Uh, it is a much smaller slice um, than the other pieces of the pie, um, but it's meant to be a very small and exploratory little satellite that's going out there and trying to understand what's actually happening with some of these new tools, some of these new behaviors, uh, and what, what, what should we do about it? Should we even act on it at all? Is there any promising stuff there? Or is it a Bitcoin? Should it be something we kind of monitor but pass on? And so I'll, I'm gonna talk about a couple of these trends. These aren't going to be new to you, I don't think. Uh, the first one is AI. Uh, so we all know and we're all seeing, I think, that um, AI is increasingly starting to be used all around the internet to create content, to summarize content, uh, and also to spread misinformation. Um, AI doesn't always uh, work perfectly. <laughs> Shocker, right? Uh, sometimes it is wrong, and it looks very authoritative, and it looks very slick, 
um, but it might not be producing very high quality content. So I just, this is an example, I wanted to learn about the canal that I was seeing uh, in Indianapolis, so I Googled it and I got essentially uh, an AI summary of Wikipedia, which is linked there on the, on the right, um, but, uh, and maybe some other sources, and um, it's giving me all this information. How do I know any of it is right? I guess I could go and check the sources myself. That takes a lot of time. Uh, from some of the future audiences experiments that we've done, we have seen that people, people don't take this all at face value all the time, literally. Um, people are pretty careful around these kinds of AI summaries, and um, those that like Wikipedia and care about Wikipedia being uh, a resource for them will take the extra step to go and read Wikipedia to see what it has to say. Um, but we also know that there was a period of time where nobody trusted Wikipedia either, and then over time they did, um, even though they knew it wasn't perfect, even though they knew it could have misinformation too. So there might be a time where more and more people just accept this AI overview uh, or whatever AI chatbot says is correct. Another big trend, and we've talked about AI a lot, a lot of conversations around the risks and dangers of AI um, as a community, but I, I, I wanna also say that this trend uh, is coming up more and more uh, in addition to risks of AI. And what this trend is, is that young people, the true young people, not the fake young people like me, uh, <laughs> really like to get information from short video platforms. Uh, much more so than going to read a long text document. Uh, short video platforms are incredibly popular amongst young people. In the US, um, Pew has been doing some research on this and currently about 40% of Gen Z go to TikTok to get their news. Um, TikTok globally has basically about the same amount of traffic as Wikipedia globally. Um, it is a major, major source of not just entertainment, but news and this, this kind of content, sort of edutainment, um, educational content that's been kind of repackaged into a more fun, entertaining um, package. Uh, and at Wikimania this year, there were several Wikipedians who, in sessions, privately when talking to me, uh, expressed that, look, I, I'm a Wikipedian. My spouse is a Wikipedian. All of my friends are Wikipedians. My teenage children, when they want to learn something, they go to YouTube. So this is real. <laughs> this is happening. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this particular example. It's a really interesting one. This is a, this is a TikTok that I found. Um, and it's uh, a, a creator sort of describing and talking about um, some fun facts about Carlisle Castle, which is a castle in England. Um, that is very besieged and, you know, very gloomy, um, very TikTok friendly here. And this person is, is presenting some information that can be found on Wikipedia and in scholarly sources about this topic. Um, but they're also starting the video with this idea of the licking stones of Carlisle Castle, which uh, is this very uh, gothic horror kind of concept that there are these stones in the dungeon that prisoners had to lick the moisture off of in order to survive when they were being held captive in this castle. And so, you know, the stones are kind of worn down because they were licked by these poor prisoners. Uh, it's a very, very TikTok fodder, right? Like, ooh, licking stones, ooh. Um, this is not in the Wikipedia article. I did some research. I found zero reliable sources confirming that this information is true. I found a lot of like ghost stories, uh, sort of trip advisor, like local rumors. Um, but this information is not um, backed up by any reliable sources. Although if you can find some and, and edit that article today for me, that would be amazing. Uh, so young people who are seeing this kind of content, they're getting this mix of some maybe good information, some maybe not so good information. Uh, and like with AI, um, what we've learned from, from doing some research on this is these audiences are not just passively accepting everything as truth. Uh, the young people who are looking at this stuff recognize that there's probably some bad information on these platforms, but they don't really have the tools to suss out the good from the bad. Uh, and if they don't even know what Wikipedia is or don't ever think to go there to look up information, 
they're, they're never going to know. Um, and what we've found in surveying a broad global population of people all over the world who use the internet um, is that this, this generation, this 18 to, to 25, 29 generation, um, has the least awareness of and the least inclination to use Wikipedia of, of any generation. So older people much more likely to know what Wikipedia is and to use it than 18 to 25, 29 year olds. So what are we going to do in a world where there's all of this cruft being amassed, all of this information that uh, is you know, either being generated by AI, being generated by people who are using AI tools, video content creators, so much noise all around us all the time in, in video, in websites, in social media, being shared with us by family members sometimes. What do we do when we encounter something like this? So let's say you just come across this uh, headline and this picture and there's an article attached to it. Um, it's about um, herbal supplements, maybe being a little bit risky. Um, you're a busy person. You have work to do. You've got people to take care of. You have maybe two minutes of your day. What are you going to do when you encounter something like this? What's your, what's your first instinct? Did I hear ignore? Ignore. Yeah, ignore. I mean, totally valid, right? Like, we're all busy people. Who has time to open up a new tab on your browser, go to Google, go to Google Scholar, go to Wikipedia even, try to find the relevant article, try to find the relevant section in the article that talks about this, try to synthesize from multiple articles usually. Like, none of us have time for that, and we're all Wikipedians. Um, this is a real problem, right? So a hypothesis that we have in future audiences is that this is a real problem. Uh, it's not that people don't even know that Wikipedia exists sometimes. They just literally wouldn't think to go there to check out information because it's such a laborious process to get there. Um, so one of our experiments was building a little browser extension that let you just do this on the website that you encounter. So it lets you select a claim and then check out to see what Wikipedia has to say about that claim. Um, so do, taking all of those long, complicated steps and just simplifying it down. Um, we tested this out a few months ago. We got about 1,000 people to try it out. Uh, and the feedback was really positive. They really liked the idea of, of this, of some kind of Wikipedia-assisted uh, internet browsing experience. Um, but when we sort of watched the data, watched the usage of, of this extension, we saw that people very quickly stopped using it. Um, and we hypothesized that that's because it's still too manual, it's still too cumbersome. People are busy, they don't have a lot of time, they don't have a lot of attention span right now. Um, so making something like this, but making it maybe more automated, kind of running in the background, maybe a native part of your browser, um, might be an interesting thing to continue to explore. And so we're having some conversations with partners who make web browsers, um, to see if we can continue to, to learn uh, further. Now, the other thing about building an, an experience like this is that it also lets us create a way to find new information that isn't in Wikipedia. So if this very shady looking article actually had something really uh, novel and valuable that might be missing from Wikipedia. Maybe it has a study from 2024 that just hasn't been mentioned on the Wikipedia article related to this topic yet. Uh, we also created an extension that allows you to find that information, check to see again what Wikipedia has to say. Is it already in the article? Is it not in the article? Uh, and then add it as a suggestion to the talk page if it's something that you think um, might be relevant to add to Wikipedia. Uh, so both of these tools are using AI, but they're not using AI to write any content, to, uh, to publish anything to Wikipedia. They're just using AI to simplify the experience of browsing, searching, pulling together different uh, pieces of article content uh, and providing information to a human who can sort of make a better judgment call um, about what should or should not be added. So that's the kind of stuff that we're doing to understand and unpack some of these trends and some of these opportunities uh, that we have to show up in a completely different way. 
Uh, and none of these things are meant to live on forever in their current state. They're very experimental. Um, but we hope that we'll find some really promising new strategies. Uh, and if and when we do, uh, the goal of our team is to make the case for bigger investments into new teams, new technologies at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, to pursue them and to make them into real products. Uh, so I have shamelessly stolen a slide from Selena Duckelman, our Chief Product and Technology Officer, sitting over there. Uh, this is a slide that she showed last year um, when talking about multi-generational strategy. And it's something we think a lot about, we talk a lot about. Um, and future audiences, the thing that I just talked about, obviously a really, really important component of it. But also a really important component of multi-generational strategy is the current generation. All of you find people who are already here today, who are already enthusiastically participating in Wikipedia and all Wikimedia projects, uh, supporting you, finding ways to make your lives easier, to, to let you do what you do but better, is a really big component of getting to the next 10, 15, 50, 100 years. Uh, there is literally no way that we can do this without you. So uh, at this conference, you're going to see a lot of Wikimedia Foundation staffers who are really excited to talk to you about improving the mobile experience and charts and commons and all kinds of other things um, that matter today to current audiences of Wikimedians. So please find them. Please talk to them. They want to improve your lives. Um, so I want to close on a hopeful note. I am personally an optimist, uh, and I think it's nice to always remind ourselves why we do this in the first place. I mean, yes, we all love to learn and to research and to write and to argue with each other online, but at the end of the day, we're producing an incredible resource that's really valuable to, some, to a lot of people in the world. And these are just some quotes from donors uh, to give you a sense of how important Wikipedia is in people's lives. Uh, we have created this resource, uh, and it has filtered out to the internet. It's now in the training data of all of these large language models. It's now all over the place in the content that people are making in video form. Uh, there's even a copy of Wikipedia on the moon. So literally, if civilization crumbled, if the internet collapsed, uh, we've still got a backup up there. <laughs> Uh, I guess unless aliens come, which I don't, that's, that's game over. But uh, we have a backup of the content. The content is there. No one can take it from us. Possibly. <laughs> However, what we do not have a backup for is you all. All you people sitting in this room today and all of the people contributing to Wikipedia all over the world today. There is no backup for that. We have to keep finding those people. We have to keep inviting them proactively to be a part of our movement. And like I showed you, I hope, uh, this isn't a new thing for us. We've been having to do this for the past two decades. We've been having to adapt to, to new technologies, to new way of doing things online in order to get those new people to come and participate. Uh, we've made intentional changes in our projects to policies, to tools, that have changed the course of Wikipedia in the past. We've done it, us. Uh, we can do it again. None of the things that we're facing are insurmountable. We just have to be open and excited to explore them together. So thank you all so much.